Gregor Zavcher um, talking about <laughs> fair data. Let me let me share the screen. It's actually really it's really cool experience. You know, before non-con, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, it's a mind bender. So um, basically, what we uh, what we are going to uh, look at it uh, today uh, during this talk is um, how actually fair data principles can be design process of also designing solutions uh, that tackle the current crisis uh, in the world. Moreover, maybe even to think about that it's essential to tackle them in this way. So um, the world, yes, the world changed, you know, uh, like, like I mentioned before, uh, when we spoke about this conference, uh, it was actually completely different. And uh, there are many things uh, happening uh, also besides, besides the virus uh, that we are uh, seeing. Uh, so for one thing, if I, uh, on previous talks uh, on other conferences, and if I used to talk um, how the physical and the virtual are merging, now we kind of see like this digital acceleration in place. It's like this mass shift in uh, user habits, uh, um, how they change. The virtual has become the place to be. Uh, at the same at the same time, what we also see is uh, that this or the other way, our actual being in the uh, physical space is kind of becoming restricted for uh, various reasons. So uh, at the same time, there is also more uh, mainstream awareness becoming about the power of data. Uh, we see how it's being, how data is being used uh, to tackle the uh, uh, pandemic in uh, various countries from China, South Korea, Singapore, uh, etc. And basically, yes, there is an app for that in all these uh, countries. So, uh, but what we are seeing at the same time, it's like uh, a lot of measures are being uh, taken, a lot of new laws, uh, subsidies, uh, et cetera, financial aid. But this or the other way, also some privacy violating things just keep on creeping in. And also a lot of times, uh, often in these days, it's mentioned that it's uh, for the social good. So, in a way, in a way, what we see is like, for, it's kind of like Black Friday, you know, it's like, it's emergency situation. Now we can, now we can uh, go away, uh, get away with this and this and these things. So uh, just as an example, um, just a week ago uh, in Slovenia or uh, a law was proposed that was uh, passed this week, uh, were uh, among, I think around 150 articles there were like just two articles in there, which luckily everybody just asked themselves, why do we need them? And it was about enabling facial, big scale uh, facial recognition in the country without any judiciary oversight or anything. So yeah, it's like, we are seeing lots of changes in many areas that are maybe not also always necessarily linked uh, to, the, to the virus itself. And under the cover of Corona-related measures, uh, in essence, the surveillance state is uh, expanding. But now, uh, not to also just be in this way, kind of dooms, doomsday scenario, uh, another important question that we need to ask ourselves is also, when we take these measures is, what will happen after the virus? So even, even if we say yes, you know, for the for the greater good, for we need to act now. Uh, there are no solutions for whatever reason. If we say, uh, if we give in uh, to uh, some conditions, there's still these lingering questions. Will it get back to normal afterwards? Now, why is also this uh, important? Why is it important if we will end up in permanent state of surveillance? It's because 
this digital acceleration that we see and uh, the power of data uh, that it has in our lives uh, and how we use them, uh, we can maybe also look a bit just for a second uh, in other areas and look at what actually data is, what is personal data. And I would argue uh, that personal data is us. It's us, the moment, the moment when we use, uh, 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 when we use uh, devices or all kinds of tools, we become one cognitive system with them. So when I offload the phone numbers into the phone and I don't need to remember the phone numbers anymore, me and the phone, we are forming one cognitive system. And given how data has become a fabric of this new reality, uh, applying this in order to uh, uphold the digital integrity of the individual is becoming crucial. Now, we are moving into times, into uh, basically an era where the one who owns our data basically then owns us because the digital is so much also influencing the physical. Uh, and here, I think already as a blockchain community, as, the, as this decentralized uh, space, I, uh, we can relate to the my data, my keys. So if I, if I control uh, my data, then I have this uh, sovereignty in the digital world. And this is, this is important. This is an important ground, which maybe we need to uh, be aware of that in the digital age, freedom basically begins with truly owning personal data. Now, in the beginning, and uh, uh, we touched upon it a bit before I mentioned fair data. So what is fair data first, maybe to set some context, it's, you could think of it sort of like as a digital equivalent of fair trade. So fair trade, we don't know exactly the principles. Uh, most of the people don't know, but in essence, we know that it's uh, against exploitation of the individual, that it's uh, protecting human rights, and that it's about fair distribution of value. So we can apply this kind of similar thinking. We can draw parallels to the digital world. So fair data can be considered sort of like as digital fair trade. Now, there is a major difference. One of them is that if, when we hear fair trade, we usually think of like a little bit in a disconnected uh, nature about the poor, poor people somewhere far away. Fair data on the other side applies to everybody who's online. So, and moreover, moreover, why is this important? It's important because we actually need an alternative to uh, surveillance capitalism. This, this also basically goes, converges into the same kind of, into the same point of uh, surveillance that I also uh, addressed before. So, but at the same time, privacy is not, just you know a technological challenge which is uh, oftentimes presented it's actually a social one and uh, for this we also need better organizational structures and better business models and we need a set of shared values we need ways how we can actually address these problems so here comes fair data society into into the picture and in the it's fair data society is a place, it's a movement where individuals address shared digital society problems, problems that address the sovereignty in the digital age uh, in a self-organized way. In other world, words, fair data society is uh, an initiative to create self-sovereign data commons. Um, and to do this, we actually need to first start with a value set. We need to start with principles. This, uh, these principles is one of the first outputs uh, that, was, that were done by Fair Data Society principles. Now, 
We will get back to this uh, a bit later. Here at this point, it is important to say that one of the big roles, what, what uh, forming shared principles, shared values uh, means is that ethics can then become a driver of the dialogue, a driver of creation. It, it becomes the social consensus. So, and only when we have also social consensus, we can then look from this perspective through this lens into how we are designing uh, solutions that actually respect human rights and uh, that protect uh, the individual and give value. Now, to come back, what what was kind of this, why, why we didn't work so much on the white paper uh, is because today, like I said before, there's an app for that. It's, we see many initiatives around uh, app development and um, developing solutions that capture data. In this regard, uh, we will use this talk today uh, to go through as an exercise uh, of a project also in the making within Fair Data Society. It's, uh, it's a project uh, about capturing data that, and then creating a data set that can basically help, help tackle the epidemics. In essence, the project contains like two parts. One is the safe mobile app. It's about contact tracing. It's about self-assessment and self-reporting mobile uh, self-reporting. The other part, the other bigger part uh, of the project is a data set, a data set uh, that helps monitoring the spread of, in this case, COVID-19 or any other uh, other disease. So, how should a contact tracing app be like. Now here, I, I want to emphasize again, the idea itself cannot be really seen as unique. We see in basically every country, this or the other way, uh, this idea taking shape or being already used. Uh, the problem, the problem is more how it is done. So from the data ethics perspective, what should be the features? Let's have a look. Now, the first feature we could say, and if we align around this, is the data should belong to the user. It's, uh, I think, uh, it's, a, it's a clear statement. Second one, the, the app should be done with privacy by design uh, in mind. If possible, there should be local or trustless execution. Uh, then users should control how and where the data is stored. Users should control how the data can be accessed, but, and they are the ones who give the consent. Uh, data collection itself should be recognized as labor. If I do self-assessment once, twice per day, if I track my movement, if I collect, organize this data, it should be recognized as labor. Now, uh, the collected and processed data, it should be also clear why it's being collected, the collected, even if it's uh, anonymized. Uh, the purposes, thinking about the purposes is basically referring, coming back to the question, what happens after? Sometimes when we think, for example, in case of data marketplaces, we shouldn't be just thinking, for example, that the data is properly anonymized. We should also consider what is this data used for? If, I, if I'm contributing my anonymized data to train some kind of models, uh, AI models that are then going to be used against me, then the whole exchange is still questionable, even though I didn't expose myself in the given moment. So uh, then uh, if we continue on this, uh, this premise, what else should this kind of an app have? So uh, the individuals also should be protected by some kind of community guidelines. An ordinary Joe from the street doesn't really know what kind of consent they are giving. Here comes like interesting topics in mind uh, when we speak about data unions, uh, 
there is actually there was a talk just uh, happening. Um, then another aspect: user should know when the data the has been accessed <clears throat> or uh, what it was used for. What we need is, in essence, trustless logging, and the whole app should be designed with a human-centric approach, uh, respecting uh, the rights. Here, uh, what we think of is also uh, the user experience, the dark patterns or not. How do we incentivize behavior? How, how should the incentives be shaped? And at the end of the day, it should be open source and the data should be interop uh, interoperatable. So how does this relate basically to Fair Data Society principles? So in action, we see that each one of these features basically basically corresponds to one of the principles that were uh, briefly presented before and it again it's not so much the point of this talk to go really into each of every principle it's more to show how it can guide thinking and how it can guide identifying requirements so one of the proposed solutions for a project like this would be for example, then coming out of this uh, insight is that there should be some kind of a self-sovereign ID used, that mobile applications should have local anonymization and personal data stored integration, that uh, the data, if it's not stored on the local device, it should be stored on a self-sovereign personal data storage. Uh, there should be GDPR in the case of Europe uh, in place because we are inter interacting with other legal entities, even though the data will be anonymized. The, the, the transfer of data, of course, should be private and the data set itself should be hosted on a platform that basically uh, allows a single source of truth uh, uh, data store where all the users of data do not need to doubt the, where the data comes from or if the data was tampered with. And yeah, so these kind of solutions, they are already in place. The building block blocks are in place. We see afterwards, after me, uh, I'm really looking forward to Victor Tron's talk. He will talk about Swarm. Swarm as the base layer, as decentralized storage can actually give support to fair data society to make these things happen. On the other side, Fair Data Society, in this regard, it's not just about on one side determining the values that we as a community, we share, but it's about acting. It's about showing and demonstrating how these things can be done. And if it's not us who do it, us as the ecosystem, then the question is actually who? So I would say that right now we are kind of on this intersection? Do we actively go towards fair data society or just by not being active, we slowly, slowly but surely slip into data slavery? To conclude, collaboration is key. So uh, fair data society is a non-profit initiative. Uh, we believe also that long-term the DAO is the way uh, and if you want to know more, you either uh, visit uh, the first link or just engage us on Twitter or on forum or somehow. Let us know what you're doing, what you're up to, and let us coordinate the efforts because this is actually bigger than us. And thank you. So yeah, that's about it. It may. How many? How many people is the Fair Data Society? Is it you? No, no, no. It's um, it's actually it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say because there's nothing really formalized. And you know, if you would look, uh, I don't know, on the GitHub, on GitHub, there's probably five or so contributors, five five developers, and none of them is me. Uh, on the on the principles, there were probably up to now in shaping the first draft, maybe 20 people involved. Then um, on white paper, 
maybe maybe 10 and this is not really overlapping uh overlapping uh people uh so some of them are of course um so i would say um the beauty of it is that it's for the time being that it's still being so undefined in the sense that uh teams are kind of now we see them solidifying you know the efforts the ideas that uh, that have time also to incubate and uh in this sense i think um given the situation that we will also see more projects uh starting to participate for example within the safe project that i mentioned we are here also in the talks with uh, uh several projects uh, there are several initiatives going on, and yeah, we see. Uh, let's see. That is. Uh, that you know, it's like, are you, are you fair data? Are you fair data society? Yeah. It's it's a difficult question. So actively involved uh, people that contributed in this or the other way, I would say it's about thirty core, five to <clears> ten. <throat> I just wanted to say that um, since Fair Data is like working close to Swarm, it it also serves as a uh, first tester and um, like a sample platform to develop the underlying technology also. So this is good, like a first um, useful set of small apps or modules. Also, this serves, I think, a lot for. Yes testing here swarm yes it's uh, it's you actually do? a lot yeah about also in a way you know like identifying the layers so what i didn't speak about uh today and yeah for those uh, who no, don't know me a disclaimer i'm also part of swarm team so uh i didn't speak about what i call so-called fair data stack and you know if you look at the fair data stack we could see like a fair data stack also uh stands for cell sovereignty we could we could look at it as swarm being the base layer the infrastructure the tcp ip of the fair data economy then we have then we have fair data society as this kind of bridge between the tech and the social it's uh, where basically human rights are being guarded and established and then within this scope within these constraints that the fair data society sets up uh, the third layer is the enterprise layer, the where businesses can unlock the value. So, so yeah, like David said, uh, here it's definitely the interaction between these two layers, Swarm and Fair Data Society. Uh, it's uh, in a way, I would maybe even symbiotic, so to say. Um, but this also, this is also, I think it's important driver that we see. Uh, I mean, we see the same kind of principles happening already in the Ethereum space, uh, in the decentralized space. So there was like this paper from article from Joel Monegro about teen applications. And he basically also breaks down the, you, could, you can see like kind of like these similarities between these three layers. You know, in DeFi, you have Ethereum, then you have things like Compound on top of it. And then you have apps like, uh, insta app so we see this also what what this fair data stack brings on one side it's uncoupling of the application it's the data source is not necessarily part of the application anymore the data store and we also see this in the blockchain space it's all the all the depths all DeFi depths basically use are uncoupled from the data store and they use the same one they use the blockchain to read the the data for the user so yeah that's how it is i hope and that's what we make happen spend some more time talking about how uh fair data stack is integrated with with Swarm, without giving away much, too much about what, what Victor is going to talk about after you. So it's hard to say, it's hard to say that Swarm is integrated in the fair data stack in a way, 
fair data stack is a mental model to be that helps to kind of, you know, put the right relationships between different parts of tech or initiatives. So in this sense, fair data society is agnostic to what's the underlying data storage. It's about connecting the tech and the social. Right now, and I would say for the foreseeable future, I don't see personally any, uh, not many even other alternatives to Swarm that can provide so much, uh, such a strong base layer on top of which uh, we can then build the fair data economy. So, cause uh, if we want to speak truly about the fair data economy, this needs to go beyond file storage. You know, today- okay, so How does that, so how do you feel then about Filecoin, IPFS, SIA, other data storage uh, distributed, I prefer over decentralized data storage solutions that are being worked on? Why do you feel so strongly about Swarm in comparison to what's going on in IPFS? So, okay, this is, this is a very good question. Uh, I really like, I really like the, all the projects that you mentioned. It's, I think this is such an early area uh, also that uh, there needs to be a lot of different innovation efforts. So, and we all can learn from each other. Uh, in a way, in a way uh, also if we look in the long-term view, so, uh, and if I now just you know, narrow down comparison between Swarm and IPFS for me uh, is, um, In a way, one could see IPFS is a lot more uh, data discoverability protocol. Uh, and on the other side, Swarm really addresses down to the core the question of where the data is stored. Well, so, well IPNS is more the issue uh, on for IPFS about the where. Yeah, so, you know, it's like there could be like uh, in the future, you could see, for example, uh, you could also access Swarm content through IPFS or some kind of a merger where IPFS protocol is used in some kind of connection with Swarm. So in this sense, I see them more even as complementary systems. Now, where I see, pers uh, where I see advantages of Swarm is that with this, its incentive layer with the Swapsware and uh, Swindle framework, it actually enables creation of decentralized service networks. So, uh, with with this framework you could in future you could build airbnb without the airbnb uh, so you could really build true and powerful decentralized data depths uh, in a way in, and in this way i see swarm also that swarm takes continues where the blockchain stops when we are dealing with data when you need to deal with big data when you need to deal with private data you need you need a complementary and uh, technology to blockchain, so that you can build a truly powerful decentralized system. Okay, well, I mean, Swarm was you know the file storage yeah. Uh, yeah. part of Ethereum pretty yeah. much from the beginning. It, yeah. You know, it's 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 been there exactly. for yes. one in the in the in the in the exactly. architecture and the thinking. Yeah, it was always clear, you know, for the world, com the world computer also needs, needs a disk in essence, you know, so uh, now maybe also the one other uh, difference that I see uh, between Swarm and other projects is that Swarm, I think, goes the extra mile in terms of privacy. So, uh, the the way how architecture is designed and this uh, victor will probably speak more about it uh it's swarm can actually enable zero leak communications so that no metadata yes mm -hmm. so so this you know and like with the with the uh also uh early on i was impressed by how uh, plausible deniability is meant uh, to be part of uh, Swarm. So uh, plausible deniability means if I'm running a Swarm node and hosting chunks of data, 
this data goes through cryptographic magic in such a way that that chunk could be part of my Facebook photo or part of some illegal content movie. Nobody can know. So it really protects again, you know, uh, the, the network. It's more in this sense also resilient. And of course the upload and disappear feature. I can upload to the network, turn off the computer and the data is still there. So this, this I think it's mega important actually. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of time frame do you see not in the development of any individual technical solution, what sort of time frame do you believe that we're looking at socially that this is the way that things are done? Is it a decade? Is it two decades? Or is it in the immediate future, two to five years? Yeah, I think rather two than five. Really? I think we are, we are seeing really now there's been things brewing like, but uh, with the current situation, we see it really kind of accelerating. It's, uh, we see it on the end user side, how much they are now, you know, on the screen in the virtual. We see it, uh, uh, we see it also um, uh, in the politics. It's like big countries thinking of their own internet, how geopolitics is being uh, uh, part of this. We see, like, if you look what's happening to TikTok in USA, when it's the first successful social media app that's not US-based, and then immediately USA has problems or where, where that personal data goes. So it's uh, currently Finland is presiding the EU, and uh, actually fair data is one of the, uh, their three main pillars. So uh, we see uh, some countries are recognizing uh this importance and um i think allow me to interrupt you yes um, let's contemporize it do yeah. you believe that this current push for personal tracking due to the covid situation that we're in will lead to better data protections or do you think that it will essentially uh solidify the non-existing protections that we've seen in the past St from the state side? I think it's up to us. I think it's up to us how fast we move forward. I think, uh, I think that governments or states, they are concerned that they want to have solutions. They're thinking about themselves, but it's kind of like, you know, imagine. So you have, a, you have two websites, website A and website B same design same functionalities everything is the same but now website a has the fair data stamp on it and website b doesn't which one will you choose so europe europe has been always big on human rights i think if the community can really show uh the power of collaboration if we can basically give proposals and show here is the open source tech it can be used I think that at least in Europe, this kind of tech can be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we have more yeah. of a tendency than, than the other large informational blocks, yeah. than yeah. Asia or America. Yeah. I think yeah. there is this cultural uh, tendency we had right yeah. to be forgotten that started in France and made it up to the EU level. We have multiple people. Uh, we don't have any sort of power with the pirate parties, but we do have those voices from the, from the, from the technological side of our, of our community that do percolate up uh, through the government structures. We have great things happening here in Vienna as well along these lines. Um, so, I mean, I hold out, I hold out a rational faith in, in, in self-interest uh, on the level of human rights in Europe. So, I, you know, yeah, exactly. So, one thing that I didn't mention in the talk, what I found like really interesting these days, I don't know if you saw that Google started to publish data, like G-Static or it's called something like that. Yeah. And basically I was looking at this report for Slovenia and it's really good data. It's really good insights. It's aggregated, it's anonymized, but it's, you know, kind of like this sweet, sour feeling where you become aware that Google has better data than your country.
No, it's kind of like this feeling. It makes you think, so Google published this data. And then if I think, doesn't matter as an ordinary citizen or if I would think as a government official, what kind of relationship, what kind of I am with uh, with Google, towards Google, you know, I can, I, I cannot really deal with the same data. And this just shows that some things are not right. So if we are carrying around the phones, if we are doing the work, we are collecting the data, at least by default, we should also have like this data available in a very easy way. So that even if David here, for example, makes an initiative and builds an app uh, at home and publishes on GitHub, that is like, data structure specified stuff like that where people can can come together today we cannot do this we actually don't have the infrastructure for this without google knowing i just want to ask a question um but the question would be so you we were just talking about google and all this data they collect and there is um a gdpr requirement that if you ask for your data you could get it now it doesn't say how you might get it how do you foresee, um, again, given that regulation, that we might be able to get our data from these organizations and then save it on Swarm or whatever, IPFS or one of those things? Like, do you, do you foresee that happening, that we could actually get our data in some format that's useful and then ask Google to delete it once we got it? Or is that just like a, a yes, crazy fantasy? Yes. No, 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 no. This is, this is already, this is already happening. It's called a uh, data transfer project, I think. Yeah, yeah, that data transfer project and it's, uh, let me just check quickly who's now. So currently at least Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft and Twitter are part of this. Uh, and this is a set of libraries and APIs uh, to help you to pull your data down. So, so yeah, so uh, this is, for example, uh, definitely something that it's also relevant and we've been actually looking into it uh, uh, to use in capturing this kind of data. We've been, we've been, we've been fighting for data portability for literally decades. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to, to what degree do you think you could use that data to find out um, and if they've got your biometrics and to, to what degree they're using biometrics. To what degree Google is using biometrics? Well, look, we all know there's, there's all kinds of biometrics that we don't always think about, right? So there's how yeah. fast I swipe, how hard I tap, yeah. all kinds of that stuff's easily collectible, yeah. how fast I walk, whether I'm using a bicycle or not, right? So it would be almost impossible if you just took that data, not even my facial recognition, which Google also knows, right? Um, you could quite easily recognize me and my behaviors and make absolutely no mistake that it was me because you know, like I said, how fast I tap, how fast I walk, where I really am, everything. Could, how much could we find out based on that data project that you just told us about, about how much our biometrics are already being used by these organizations? So this is the thing. I don't, I don't think that much, you know, so uh, I think also one of the one of the things is a lot of in these talks about data, personal data, it's at the end of the day, you know, like the big guys or the surveillance capitalism guys, they don't really care about your name. They don't really care about if you were born in January or February, except for some reasons. They really, you know, the power then lies in the predictive models. So once these predictive models are trained, this is, this is where that hidden knowledge is uh, for them uh, there. And it's also, this is then, this is also, it's not so much the point that, okay, now if we are in this situation where we want to pull the data, yes, we maybe use the data transfer project or something and get our past data from Google's and et cetera. But I think we also, with this increased digital aspect of our lives, we need to be aware that we are basically on this spectrum where on one side privacy uh, is privacy, on the other side it's predictability. And this is linked to the economic power. This, this is linked to, to the power that we have in the society. So it's not about 
knowing what somebody does on that website or on that website when you also said like the biometrics so you have from like tapping or voice so-called prosody if i speak fast if i speak slow uh this this can reveal my personality my current state you know i mean we can i don't need to speak some foreign language and i know if somebody is angry to to give a simple example you know and uh with all the video calls and these things it's i would imagine it's really easy it's really easy to to run through some uh, machine learning and analyze my gaze my my eye movement this this can this can reveal again a lot of things so uh and here here i would say it's unless you're really studying this it's uh it's unbelievable how how deep it can go it's like when we when we look also at things like social contagion and how how then we basically we can predict behavior it's crazy yeah so let me ask a, a preface in the next question yeah um when 911 happened i realized at that point that i could not cover my footprint on the web up until that point. Yeah. 911. So 20 how yeah 20 years ago almost, right? Um I think we're even further along now. All of those predictive data sets all exist in data centers that governments have uh have set up with data that they were in various jurisdictions, like in the United States years ago, were even by the Patriot Act, were forbidden to collect, but weren't forbidden to just buy from the, the commercial sources that were providing it. So my question is, aren't we already fucked? But aren't we already pretty well screwed with all the data that's out there and being analyzed and, and predicted on? I mean, look at Palantir. Yes. Uh, and Palantir is actually offering services. It's actually offering this kind of services for this kind of app that I was speaking to European countries. But they are protecting us. Of course, of course. Terrorism. But it's so, also true. Part, partial. I'd say, I mean, the question if we are fucked is, is a, it's, a, it's a very good question, you know? So uh, I would say that we are, as humanity, to some extent, we are in the state of being constantly in this fucked up state. So just recently, I was watching, for example, the Freud uh, TV show on Netflix. And there, there it's like a case of how hypnosis was abused against the individual's will. You know, different tools, same principle. Humanity does not learn in this sense, you know, to grow. So. Uh, what I mean with this is that, yes, there is a lot of data around. There is a lot of predictive models trained. Uh, this is still, I would say, quite elite thing. So uh, it's not that easy still to do, to do like some kind of profiling, but it's getting very democratized. It's like very, like uh, there is a proliferation of marketing tools and things like that. So all these tools are coming into the hands of people who don't need to be technical or who don't need to have uh, any power. But we've it's, had that since Foursquare yeah. with location data. Yes. And you yeah. have that with, you know, the way that any user, uh, you know, curates their own feed on, on, on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever. We're already just, we're just delivering that data, uh, you know, daily and and already at this point i mean there's there's nine billion people on the planet and in technologically advanced societies uh with personal tracking devices uh corporate issued personal tracking devices we're already part of the data flow how do you anticipate how do you get us from here to there where all of that data is not relevant See, I feel like it's more of a of a of a social political yes. question so, that I think yeah. we make the decision that that's not the way to live on a political and civilizational level. 
Yeah. So I think I think the thing is, you know, it's like you have research, you have research showing that if you speak in a transparent way with the users and if you tell them what you want to do, uh, the percentage of users who willingly give up data for free grows tremendously. So uh, I think uh, if you look at the history and uh, today I mentioned like data slavery and there are like parallels. Uh, we could call to the chattel slavery in the US, you know, that was like in the 19th century. So one of the reasons why slavery actually got abolished is because it unlocked additional economic value. It became more efficient. And uh, where I'm getting with this is, I think, I think if, if we recognize that dealing with data in a fair data manner actually can unlock a lot more uh, value and potential. We, and this, this is actually for all the stakeholders. What do you mean uh, by value? Financial value or social value? Reputational. So, so, you know, it's like, in essence, it's like this. If I need to stalk you around and gather the data, my data will be partial. It's, it's questionable of what kind of quality it will be because I'm going into compromises. If I come to you and you you put your data, your work in front of me, I get quality data. Based on that, if I use quality data uh, within my machine learning, et cetera, I can provide a more quality service. So, so this all leads, uh, I think uh, that we should actually, in a way, it's a very simple, you know, question. Like if I would ask somebody, um, they, they, they will say, uh, we are open source. And I would say, why would you be open source? Everybody's going to see your code. You know, you don't have any advantage then because your code is open source. But, but developers, projects who really know what open source is about, we all know that we actually are getting a lot more. We are getting the community, you know, it's like the code being validated, it can grow. It's like, it's a totally different value proposition. And the same applies to the data economy. By having transparent, fair and ethical relationships set up instead of this stalking game, everybody can, uh, can actually have benefits. You know, I know that the state needs my biometric data and I know that like the Chinese said, with our facial recognition, we identified, we found 5,000 kids or something like that. Yes, the tech can be used well, but at the same time, I want to know if uh, the government of, if the state of Slovenia is using the biomet accessing biometric database with my photo, I want to know why and that they did it. And these are like basically the rules that we need to establish.